The moon, the biggest mystery of mankind. It inspired the ambition to leave our home planet. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. 50 years ago, the first astronaut step onto the moon. Now we want to return, and this time we're coming to stay. Man and the Moon, a special kind of love story. Everything began no less than 4.5 billion years ago. The Earth is still young and makes its rounds alone in the endless universe. When, from the depths of space, a great celestial body begins to approach. The two planets merge. A cosmic union from which our moon emerges. If mankind had been around at the time, they would certainly have spread joyful words of this birth. Because the child of the Earth, our moon, is an extraordinary stroke of luck. We all carry its DNA inside us. Perhaps that is why we are constantly looking for and discovering more details of this passionate story. Is the moon our place of yearning? Simply a beautiful place for the mind, the imagination, and what might be there. Without the moon, one could say there would be no life on Earth. The moon inspires songs, descriptions, and paintings. The moon is just a part of being a human. It kind of speaks to all of us. What would we be without the moon? Some of the most beautiful music compositions are dedicated to it, like Claude Debussy's Ode to the Moonshine, Claire de Lune. Since the beginning of time, it has been our nocturnal companion that encouraged us to think about the nature of life. About becoming and passing. Because the moon is reborn every month, The fascination can also be expressed more prosaically in the form of data sets. It's our closest neighbor. A flight to the moon only takes three days nowadays. It has gigantic mountain ranges. The temperatures fluctuate between extremes. Unlike the Earth, the moon has no magnetic field and no atmosphere. The family relationships of the moon are complex. It has at least 172 siblings in the galaxy. Small ones, green ones, some made entirely of ice. And new ones are constantly being discovered. Just recently, 12 new Jupiter moons. But none of the many moons is as close and familiar to man as ours. Prospective astronauts have had to make do with Earth as their training grounds for a long time. Lanzarote instead of Luna Incognita, but 50 years after the first moon landing, this could change. Matthias Maurer is training to fulfill his dream, the next mission to the moon. Here we have the Apollo hammer. A hammer is the most important tool for any geologist because they can use it to break up or loosen stones, which I'll then fly back to Earth and examine. 
And I think there are still some tools lying around on the moon, including hammers like this, because the astronauts obviously prefer to take samples of the moon back to Earth. And they therefore left all the heavy equipment behind on the moon. You can also still find the astronauts' moon boots up there. The team from the European Space Agency, ESA, is simulating a geological expedition on the volcanic island of Lanzarote. Space experts, geologists, astronauts and their trainers are rehearsing the next moon explorations here. They are reconstructing the partially forgotten know-how of the Apollo pioneers and testing new technologies. Back in Apollo times, everything was mechanical, but today we also have electronic devices that we want to take with us to the moon, such as a tablet like this that we use to document which samples we're taking and send pictures directly to the ground. On the other hand, I'll also receive images from the control center that tell me exactly, take the stone on the left and not the one on the right that you wanted at first. It's actually very important to have that kind of information. But the problem I have here is that it's hard to operate a tablet like this with the thick fingers. That's why we've had a little tool developed by students. It's actually a pointer that I can use the tablet with. It works, but I think it could be a bit better. We have to work on that. Will Matthias Maurer bring moon rocks back to Earth? For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this Earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done. And one in our prayers that you will return safely to Earth. Four days after man first set foot on the moon, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins return to Earth. And the world celebrates its first moonwalkers. But the Apollo 11 heroes have to watch the celebrations from the isolation lab. Too great is the fear of alien viruses. Richard Nixon declares the week of the Apollo mission the greatest in world history, only topped by the creation of the Earth. In the meantime, the valuable freight of the Apollo program is secured next door. The first rocks collected by man from another celestial body. The astronauts bring exactly 21.55 kilograms of moon back to Earth. After a total of seven Apollo missions, our cosmic neighbor is 382 kilos lighter. The moon rock, the true treasure of the Apollo missions. To this day, it is heavily guarded and kept in the Lunar Sample Building of the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Vera Assis Fernandez is a planetologist. She uses moon rock to research the creation of our satellite at the Leibniz Institute in Berlin and in Manchester. Getting her hands on the material was an adventure in itself. For these Apollo samples that I have here, uh, yes, I had to go to Johnson Space Center. The scientists could not simply take the moon rock with her. Oh, I wanted to go to John Space Center and select them myself. This is because the samples are stored in a high security laboratory, shielded from the environment. You have to go to the special area where the samples are kept. They have these chambers that are filled with nitrogen inside. Each is um, for a specific landing site. There's a cabinet for Apollo 15, the cabinet for Apollo 11, the cabinet for Apollo 17. They rolled down the, the samples from a little canister into a dish, and then I had to pick uh, the fragments that I, I wanted. Tiny quantities are finally sent to the scientists at the Leibniz Institute in Berlin. A small sensation of her research was the discovery of a new mineral that was first discovered through the moon samples. This is a 
high titanium basalt, like it's typical for Apollo 17. And uh, here, okay, you had the, this initial uh, minerals forming, it's called armalcolite, so arm for Armstrong, uh, coal for Collins, and Al for Aldrin. The first time that this man mineral was ever, ever seen was on Apollo 11 samples. The armalcolite was later also found on Earth. This supported Vera Assis Fernandez's theory of the creation of the moon. The impactor could not be that dissimilar to the Earth, and that this, with this calcium isotope uh, work and some other work, is showing that maybe these two bodies actually their chemistry was more similar than being initially thought. On Earth, it is easy to collect rock samples. Sometimes they even include meteorites from the moon. But only the Apollo rock provides genuine information about the history of the creation of Earth and moon. I'm a geologist and the moon is a rock, it's a huge, and it has huge mountains, large, uh, like taller than you have on Earth. So I think I, one part I like of the moon is the contemplation part of it. And the other one is because it's what we call a dead planet, so it doesn't, didn't have, a it's not as dynamic as the planet Earth. So it has preserved a lot of the history since its formation, which was not too long after the, the Earth formed, so and has preserved a lot of this history. What is still hidden underneath the surface of the moon? At Solitude Castle in Stuttgart, the artist Hagen Betzwieser presents his story of the celestial body. He possesses a pretty impressive piece of the moon. How does an artist get a piece this size? Was it a gift? Not to forget, President Nixon sent moon samples to 135 heads of state as a diplomatic gesture in the year 1972 alone. Or is it stolen? For the 382 kilograms of moon rock that came back to Earth 50 years ago with the Apollo missions, the majority has mysteriously disappeared. In our work, as good as a moon rock, the core consists of rabbit wire and plaster bandage. The surface is composed of a substance called JSC-1 lunar regolith, a synthetically produced lunar dust commissioned by NASA simply because there is de facto not enough lunar dust. Hagen Betzwiese dedicates himself to the side notes, investigates the bizarre questions of space travel. For example, what does the moon smell like? The lunar dust which stuck to the astronaut suits fills the spaceship with the unmistakable smell of the moon. The astronauts describe this smell very precisely. Hagen Betzwieser has a perfumer create the smell of the moon based on these descriptions. It is trapped inside these balloons. Voila! The moon smells like wood powder, gunpowder, and rotten eggs. Even Buzz Aldrin confirmed that the smell of the moon that we created is very damn close to the smell that we have. I think what is really interesting is what I call space awareness. Space awareness is the task or the notion to communicate what happens in space. And that's very interesting and exciting. It's fun and you can do this in art as well as in science. The artist is also already training for the next mission to the moon. Maybe they're still looking for another astronaut. Hagen Betzwieser is ready and waiting. Astronomy is a very interesting topic in art, because art and science were united a long time ago and were then clearly separated for a long, long time. 
My personal story is that I originally wanted to be an astrophysicist, but realized when I was around 16 that I was actually much more interested in the image that science uses to communicate science than in doing science itself. His As Good as a Moon Rock will be on display at the London Observatory on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing. No sooner had the moon been born than it was hit by a gigantic meteorite at its South Pole. The South Pole Aiken Basin was formed. Countless other impacts damaged its thin crust. Lava flows escaped and cooled. A never-ending meteor shower finally pulverizes its surface. The result is the blotchy surface of the moon, its typical face that inspires myths and legends all over the world. In Berlin, in the Neues Museum, we meet cultural scientist and author Bernd Brunner. He has explored the question of why the moon has inspired cultural history more than any other celestial body. For early mankind, the moon was simply the most striking object in the sky. Of course, you can see the sun, but you can't look into it because it's so bright that it blinds you. In this regard, the moon is a little more pleasing to the human eye. You could look at it, and it made you think about how to explain the different patches on the moon. Mountains, craters, and the shadows they cast, seen from Earth, Dot, dot, comma, line, the moon face is looking fine. Man kann natürlich alle möglichen of course, you can read all kinds of pictures in these shadowy forms. Uh, Personally, I find the idea of a rabbit with long ears quite convincing. In Chinese mythology, a hare hops over the lunar surface and mixes the elixir of life for the lunar goddess Chang'e. And from West Africa, the view in the sky reveals a crocodile in the moon. The fact that the face of the moon is so familiar to us also has something to do with the fact that we only ever see one side of it. In Astronomy for Amateurs, the French astronomer Camille Flammarion explained the phenomenon more than a hundred years ago with a simple sketch. A boy spins the moon in a circle on a string. The hand spinning the moon is the Earth. We only ever see one half of the moon, namely the one attached to the string. The moon orbits our planet at a distance of 385,000 kilometers. It remains connected to us by an invisible band. This so-called bound rotation provides us with stability. Myths and legends about the face of the moon were already debunked in 1609 by Galileo Galilei and his telescope. Only one year later, he published his precise drawings of the moon's surface in Sidereus Nincius, the messengers of the stars. The telescope revealed that the face of the moon actually is composed of terrain structures. Carolyn van de Bogert is a planetologist and today works on the most accurate images of the moon on behalf of NASA. It's, it's very exciting to see what somebody who had worked on the moon so long ago decided to draw. Also, just things that, that we can see at night, but he also had a telescope that was just sort of the, the cut, you know, the state of the art at the time. And what we have now from from bigger and better, better telescopes and from missions is the, a closer and more high resolution view of the moon. And so that lets us look at more of the details, but just from, from standing back at the big picture, Galileo already had a good view of, of what was actually going on on the moon. Galileo's Messenger of the Stars is still found in the University Library in Munster today. 
The Catholic Church put the work on the list of prohibited books at the time. Nevertheless, it was unable to prevent the spread of knowledge. And that he was able to then put this into a book and then have the book printed because so that other people could look at it is really sort of the beginning of, of the publication of scientific work and the sharing of scientific work so that it wasn't just for a few elite um, academics or, or noble people to, to work on. Carolyn van de Bogert and her team are very close to the next moon mission. The planetologist researches and teaches at the University of Munster. In 2018, she was appointed to the scientific team of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera by the US space agency, NASA. The space probe orbits the moon, close above its surface, and takes photos of it in high resolution. Carolyn van de Bogert and her team are working on the evaluation of the camera data for the next moon missions, which are already being planned in detail. We need to figure out which targets we want to take pictures of and to use the other instruments that are on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to, to determine where we might like to collect samples of the moon, where new robotic missions could go on the moon. And so basically this was one of the, the major um, goals of the mission was to define exploration sites for astronauts that are going to go to the moon. 50 years after the first moon landing, new destinations are possible. The Apollo missions all had to go to the near side of the moon because they needed to communicate with the Earth and be available all of the time. So we have then maybe samples from just a handful of places on the moon, but if you just went to a handful of places on the Earth, you still wouldn't have a complete picture of how the Earth formed. And so we want to go back and get more samples to compare with this wonderful remote sensing data that we've recently been collecting. The next generation of astronauts could land on the dark side of the moon and deliver further findings about the creation of our satellite. Long before space probes explore the moon, the night is the astronomer's hour. The meeting place for the best of their time in the 17th century is Paris. As the lights above the city are slowly extinguished, astronomers at the Paris Observatory enter the Great Dome to explore the sky. Today, as 350 years ago, The instruments, everything is all old. You feel like you're slipping into the costume of a 19th century astronomer. Apart from the electricity, nothing has changed. You make a leap in time, go back centuries, and it feels like back then. Our predecessors worked here, so close to the sky, put their eyes on the eyepiece like we do. You feel very privileged. The observations made here at the observatory are milestones in the history of moon exploration. At night, the sky is observed above the rooftops. And during the next day, the observations are transferred onto paper in the library, creating increasingly precise maps of the moon. But why do we need maps of the moon? What travelers should they serve in those days? Louis XIV founds the Paris Observatory. The Sun King gathers together the best astronomers of his time and founds the Royal Academy of Sciences. 
Here, works are created that shape the history of research worldwide. Shortly after Galileo made his observations of the moon at the beginning of the 17th century, the Paris Observatory began its work. Its first director is Cassini. He arrives two years after its foundation in 1667. He immediately begins to study all sorts of objects, but devotes himself above all to his great project to create a very precise cartography of the moon. Précise de la Lune. A race with ever better telescopes begins. One more accurate drawing of the Moon follows the next, but Giovanni Domenico Cassini has the edge. He allows himself a small artistic freedom with the very precise lunar map, a crater in the shape of a heart. He drew sketches of the moon in different phases of the moon and put them together to form a complete map of the moon, which was the most precise at that time and which remained the most precise, including small details and the ideas of contrasts, shadows, etc., until photography comes into play and the first photographs of the moon are taken. From 1885 onwards, large format photographs of the Moon's surface were taken here over a period of 10 years on the Large Reflector Telescope. The Paris Moon Atlas offers the sharpest mapping of the Earth's satellites to date. It was here that the first photographic atlas was really created, which was subsequently even relevant for the preparation of the first Apollo moon mission. They still use these first atlases from the observatory. For Pascal Descon, the story of the Apollo landing therefore begins right here, at his favorite place above the rooftops of Paris in the 17th century. After the first moon landing, the astronauts want to take off for their new moon missions. Zero gravity tests during parabolic flight, Matthias Maurer is a member of the six-person astronaut corps of the European Space Agency. His ultimate aim is the next lunar mission, for which the material scientist is training hard. The basic training lasts two years, the majority of which he has already completed. Spaceship of the future, Orion, which will bring the next astronauts to the moon, is almost ready. For the Apollo astronauts, it was really a departure into the unknown. It was a flight to the moon. Never before had anyone been on the moon or orbited the moon. And it was the very first landing on another celestial body. And that is, of course, a challenge to do something that no person has ever done before. I have great respect for the astronauts of the Apollo missions. And I think this is a great example for the astronauts of my generation who want to go back to the moon and land there and who want to continue the work of the Apollo astronauts. Arbeiten der Apollo Astronauten fortsetzen wollen. But before they go up into space, they must first go down into the water. A few kilometers off the coast of Florida lies the next training station, an underwater base at the depth of 20 meters. The future astronauts have to stay underwater for 16 days longer than any astronaut before, another endurance test.
Every step of the training places extreme mental and physical demands on the astronauts. Just like on the moon, outdoor missions are limited in time. Matthias Maurer only has a certain amount of oxygen underwater. His body has to learn how to use it sparingly. It's a rocky path to the moon. Today, astronauts are no longer just test pilots as they were in the early years. Today, they have to be multi-talented. For me, becoming an astronaut means doing science. It means working with technology that's at the edge of what technology can do, what space travel really is. Technology has to work 100%, otherwise we can't fly. But space travel also means working in international teams. ISS, Americans, Russians, Canadians, Japanese, Europeans work together peacefully here. And that's very, very important for me, this international peaceful cooperation. And of course, the topic of adventure. There's hardly a profession that offers as much adventure as that of the astronaut. When the astronauts land on the surface of the moon, they must be able to get their bearings immediately. Matthias Maurer tests a camera backpack for this purpose. It provides a 360-degree panorama of the lunar environment in real time. Japanese probes have discovered a lava cave up to 50 kilometers long on the satellite. A rover was developed for unknown terrain like this, which can move autonomously if desired. A rover will take over many functions in the future, mapping the terrain, taking photos of the work, which I then report or carry out on site, but the rover should also be able to operate autonomously. Ideally, it will be equipped with many measuring instruments that provide us with a lot of information. Robots, cameras, probes. The moon is measured to the very last corner. But does this mean we know more about it than previous generations? Even back in the Stone Age, people construct gigantic calendars under the open skies. The moon marks the change between day and night. Babylonian astronomers calculate its cycle of 29 days. They brought us the month as a unit of time. But what could the people of the Bronze Age in today's central Germany know about the moon? In 1999, the sky disk was found here on the Mittelberg Plateau near Nebra in Saxony-Anhalt. At first, nobody guessed just how important this chance discovery was. It was very unlikely. It was highly unlikely that there would be such a thing in Europe. We never thought of it. But that's always the way with major discoveries in the world. No one could have imagined Earthsea. No one could have imagined the sky disk. These are really things that appear like a comet out of nowhere and absolutely astound us all. The State Museum of Prehistory in Halle an der Saale possesses the oldest graphical representation of cosmic phenomena. The Nebra sky disk has been classified by UNESCO as a cultural heritage of humanity. But what does it show? A bronze disk with sun, moon and stars? Is it easy to understand or is there a complex knowledge of the sky behind it? 1,600 years before Christ, was there a particularly well-informed group of people who already used an astronomical instrument living in southern Saxony-Anhalt? What could a society that did not yet know scripture know about the moon? The discovery of Nebra through Harold Meller's understanding of the Bronze Age into turmoil. Above all, the special thing about the sky disk is that it's completely matter-of-fact. It's comprehensible to us modern people. It's as matter-of-fact as a traffic sign. It informs in the most reduced way possible. At first, however, it is unclear what it wants to communicate in reduced form. 
For four years, scientists tried to crack the secret code. And they first discovered that 3,600 years ago, people were already trading with the whole of Europe. And now we have it here as a fantastic artifact of great value. The copper comes from the Alps, the gold from Cornwall, and they forged this fantastic memogram out of it. So was the Nebra sky disk a valuable cultic object with which a tribal prince once adorned himself? Put simply, we see sun, moon and stars. Every child would say, this is what you see at first glance. But if you take a closer look, you see, aha, it's the crescent moon, and maybe the full moon or the sun, or could it be moon and sun at the same time? In between is the seven-star constellation, which is the Pleiades. The Pleiades are mentioned in different cultures as the seven calendar stars. Whenever the crescent moon looks exactly the same in relation to the Pleiades as on the sky disk, leap days must be inserted to bring the shorter lunar year in line with the solar year. The creators of this disk also only had to compare the moon in spring and fall, when the calendar stars rose, with the golden image on the disk to know when it was time to sow or harvest. They had created a unique sky clock. What's particularly exciting about the sky disk is that you probably need knowledge from the Orient. You can deduce the rules represented on the sky disk by observing the metonic cycle of the moon yourself. But in a pre-literate culture, you'd have to observe the moon for 40 or 60 years to find that out, and this without the sky being covered, i.e. without clouds. This is possible here because there is little cloud cover in central Germany, but it's unlikely. They probably became familiar with the rules on a long journey to the Near East, to Byblos in Lebanon, to what's now Iraq or a similar place. The Islamic calendar is a pure lunar calendar. Ramadan, the month of fasting, begins also with the appearance of the crescent moon. However, as this is difficult to recognize even for trained observers, Ahmed Rash was given the task of his life. We were asked by Saudi Arabia in 2005, 2006, whether it would be possible to develop a center for moon observation and astronomy in Mecca. What it could look like and what it would involve. A moon observation center at dizzying heights. In the middle of the holy district of Mecca, the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad. The observation center is to state the exact beginning of Ramadan for all Muslims because Ramadan, like the Christian Easter, travels with the moon through the year, 11 days further forward every year. An observatory in the crescent moon on a high-rise building 600 meters above the ground, and other challenges came on top of this. In the Guinness Book of Records, the tower clock is now mentioned as the clock with the world's largest dial. In total, we have over 30 world records to report. This is the building with the highest observatory in the world. For the observatory in the crescent moon, the moon telescope had to be built in such a way that it compensates for the oscillations of the high-rise building. Inside the Tower 2, Saudi Arabia wants to connect to the time of its great astronomers, with the moon at the centre of the research. Like many other things, it was imported. When it comes to technical facilities that are just special and therefore have to meet unique requirements, 
We're sure to find someone here in southern Germany who will deliver something that works better than perhaps anywhere else. And you have them all right on your doorstep. It's all here from the area. A family business in Gomaringen was commissioned to produce the world's most accurate 3D model for the Mecca clock tower, a model of the moon. I'm a carpenter, a master carpenter, and we usually make furniture in the workshop. But the master carpenter also has a weakness for model building of all kinds. And from this, a small branch developed in our company, which produces models for museums and similar institutions. Now Joachim Flug was to make the most accurate 3D moon in the world. Every crater, every mountain, and every valley true to scale, based on the latest data from NASA. We have been commissioned to make two moons for the Mecca clock tower, the third tallest building in the world. It has two museums. One is open to the public while the other is not. And the moon was hung and presented in these rooms. In 2009, the NASA moon probe Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was launched. The aim of the mission, the mapping of the entire lunar surface in high resolution. And a Swabian family business is suddenly very close to the project. Receives the latest data from NASA with every lunar orbit. But how do you feed a joinery's milling program with data from a lunar probe? Joachim Flug's son solves the problem in theory with a doctoral thesis. But that was not the only obstacle. Well, the big challenge in the beginning was the data, because when we got the order, the LRO satellite had only been in orbit for about three or four years, and the data was not yet completely available. And it was basically a race against time for the data to be collected and released by NASA. And we actually already had the order and were behind schedule to convert this data into milling results as well. But then the copy of the moon was made on Earth. A twin made of plastic. All of its mountains, seas, bays and lakes, true to scale and divided up into 32 individual parts. The model had to be divided into segments, A, because we couldn't make it bigger on the milling machine, and B, because it had to be transported in an elevator afterwards, and we knew the dimensions of this. We then chose the shape of an icosahedron. The icosahedron stump is like the classic football, consisting of 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. And we first made these segments in modeling plastic and then molded them into glass fiber, transformed them into carbon fiber, so that we had handy and transportable segments that did not make the ball too heavy. Joachim Flug had an extra model of the moon made for NASA. They will collect their moon model on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing. Joachim Flug can remember this very well. 
Ich war noch als, als Jugendlicher. I was sitting in front of the TV as a teenager when the Apollo landed. When Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the moon with shadowy figures on the black and white TV. And now we were practically getting data directly from NASA. We downloaded them. And this within a time span of just 50 years. That's what really made me tingle and get excited about it. That we made such a big leap in development within such a short time so that we as carpenters can convert these data into a 3D form. Long before the first astronaut set foot in the lunar dust, more fantastic creatures had left their marks there. Moon geese. Around 1620, the English bishop Francis Godwin wrote one of the first works of science fiction, The Man in the Moon. In the novel, he depicts the voyage of Domingo Gonzalez, who uses moon geese to travel to our cosmic neighbor. At the time, scientists really believed that migratory birds spent the winter on the moon. Today, ornithologists know for a fact that they don't. But how do the animals navigate so precisely to the south and back? This remained a mystery the ornithologists are now trying to solve. Baikonur. It was from here in 1961 that Yuri Gagarin became the first human to fly into space. In 2018, preparations are underway here for the launch of an animal observation project that will also take biology into a new dimension. Initiator of the Icarus project, Martin Vikelski, director of the Max Planck Institute. Today is the end of a long march. We started 16 years ago with an idea, and I mean, that's why we chose the name. We thought, you know, everybody thought this is crazy. It won't, it won't fly. And we said it will fly. In February 2018, the launch of Icarus on the spaceport in Baikonur is imminent. A rocket will bring the huge receiving antenna to the International Space Station. Icarus is the high-tech version of a field of research that goes back a long way. We already can track some large animals, but what we need is a system that tracks small animals. And not only track them, not only give us a GPS position, but also tell us what the animals are doing. Icarus launches, and the international team celebrates. From 2019, hundreds and thousands of animals will be able to be observed simultaneously in almost every corner of the world. The antenna has already been successfully mounted onto the outer shell of the ISS in an outdoor mission taking almost seven hours. During the test phase, the antenna provides data with initial indications about the global swarm behavior of animals. In the next step, Martin Vikelski wants to equip thousands of animal species with small transmitters. What's really special is that this is easily produced as an, a solar panel, a circuit board and a battery. And this will be uh, stripped on animals like a backpack. As soon as the ISS is in orbit above the animals, the transmitter is activated and sends the motion data up to the ISS. And in our mind, it will revolutionize uh, biology. Acting as living measuring stations, the animals could also provide information on wind and weather, temperature, ozone or carbon dioxide content, says the researcher. In this way, they could help to improve climate models or even predict natural disasters. What Vikelski has in mind is a network of living sensors, an internet of animals, as it were. The new approach of Icarus is that it's an optimized system for tracking animals. It gives us a, a knowledge of exactly what the animal is doing. Is the animal sick? Does the animal have a problem? Uh, does it interact with other individuals? The insights from that are, I think, unbelievable. There, there's, there's so much that animals can tell us. It's a long journey for the data, all the way to the ISS and back. But the scientists hope that evaluating it will enable them to better understand life on our planet. The Kennedy Space Center, NASA's spaceport in Florida. Starting in December 1968, all manned spaceflights of the Apollo mission launched from here. The relics of the first moonwalkers can still be admired here. And now the next moon mission is in the planning. 
the Apollo technology, the Apollo technology may seem outdated from today's point of view, but the theory is still valid. This means that we have to make a similar landing approach, we have similar difficulties to overcome. But today, we have a lot more technology on board, and this technology offers us security. Experts on space travel today have other goals in sight than the Apollo planners back then. On the next moon mission, astronauts will not only be coming to walk on the moon, next time they are coming to stay. Work is already underway on the lunar village of the future. For us, the challenge is not so much to land there just to be there. We want to land there, to set up a station to carry out long-term research. The South Pole would be a possible location for the planned station, one of the coldest places in the solar system. So far, the astronauts have never been to the South Pole or the South Pole region of the Moon. This is a very exciting area, because the moon's oldest crater can be found there. It's very exciting for the scientists to explore this area. In addition, huge deposits of water ice are thought to be there, but this still has to be proven. And descending into these deep craters, recovering this water ice and then using it, that will be the greatest challenge for manned spaceflight. Fifty years after the first Apollo landing, the moon is back in the spotlight. Its fascinating story continues. <laughs>